Hello, everybody, and welcome to Children with Diabetes screen side chat. Ray, Dr. Rehan Lal is just getting his slides up and going. And while he is doing that, I am going to read his bio, if that's all right, Rehan. What do you think? Sounds, sounds great, Marissa. Great, and my name is Marissa. I am the clinical director for children with diabetes. I am a nurse. I am a diabetes education and care specialist, and I've lived with type one diabetes for 31 years. And Dr. Rehan Lal is a pediatric and adult endocrine faculty at Stanford. He grew up in the Bay Area in California and always wanted to be an engineer. He has lived with type one for 30 years studied electrical engineering and computer science at the University of California, Berkeley. His two younger sisters were enrolled in the DPT-1 trial where they found that they had antibodies that were positive and they developed type one diabetes. So in an effort to help all his brothers and sisters with diabetes, Rehan decided to switch career paths and pursue clinical medicine at University of California, Davis. He couldn't decide whether to take care of children or adults, so he did both. <laughs> he completed a four-year residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Southern, Southern California, working with the underserved at Los Angeles County Hospital. Rehan then completed an adult and pediatric endocrine fellowship at Stanford University. As an engineer and physician scientist with diabetes, his primary interest is the design, development, and testing of new diabetes technologies and therapies with his mentor, Dr. Bruce Buckingham. He collaborates with many members of the Stanford Diabetes Research Center, industry, and the open source diabetes community in an effort to bypass the biological, technological, and human factor limitations of existing devices. Welcome, Rayhan. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, so great to be here and thank you so much for the invitation to talk about this uh, very important and very salient topic right now, which is diabetes and COVID-19. Um, can uh, you see slides all right on my end? Yes, I see them. Awesome. Okay, so guys, uh, just some quick disclosures here. I do consult for Abbott, uh, BioLink, Capillary Biomedical, Morgan Stanley, and Tidepool. Um, Marissa did a great job giving my uh, introduction there, uh, but generally speaking, I'm a person with diabetes, an engineer, a brother of two sisters with diabetes, a doctor, and a scientist who's really in love with diabetes technology. So um, let's, let's dive right in because I know this is going to be a really fertile ground for discussion, and I really do want to leave a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, as much as I know, at least. Um, so let's start just, I, I want to, I always like to start with a very high level introduction. So let's talk about viruses in general, um, rather than moving straight into Corona. Um, so a virus has genetic material. It's either DNA, uh, which we use as our genetic material, which is the minority of viruses or RNA, which is the majority of uh, viruses, surrounded by a protein called a capsid and sometimes uh, a lipid bilayer uh, to help trick its way into our cells. Uh, basically, this viral particle has to hijack a host cell to replicate. So in other words, it's not technically alive. It needs us in order to do its uh, business. So our immune systems, therefore, must recognize and destroy our own infected cells when we get a viral infection. Now, this may, may ring uh, true to a few people. Um, you know, this is oftentimes connected to the hygiene hypothesis um, for type 1, where we think about, hey, can viral particles make our immune system shift more towards a self-self-recognition state uh, as opposed to third world countries where parasites and bacteria might be more common. And that pushes our immune system away from self-recognition potentially. 
Okay, so let's talk about coronavirus next. Coronaviruses are large enveloped positive strand RNA viruses that generally cause respiratory infection in human hosts. Uh, of interest, they can cause gastrointestinal sy sy symptoms more in uh, pigs uh, and other uh, variety of illness in other mammal species. Basically, these uh, viruses encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, uh, which is a big enzyme that basically just means it's used to help copy um, the virus and make more of it. The genetic material that makes up this coronavirus. When we say positive strand, what that means is, is that the natural systems in our bodies that convert genes into proteins, they can act on the positive strand RNA uh, to directly translate viral proteins, including this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, in terms of clinical features of coronavirus infection in people, uh, it been known to cause the common cold, uh, although other viruses do that as well, uh, severe adult respiratory uh, uh, syndrome, and the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome. Now, in terms of COVID-19 specifically, uh, so this is a type of coronavirus, and it expresses something called spike protein, which you can see here. Spike protein binds to a receptor that we have on cells uh, throughout the body, but a lot of it is expressed in the lungs, for example. Um, and this ACE2 receptor uh, is, is important for vascular and endothelial function. Um, but let's look on the right at where exactly the protein is expressed, because these are all places that the virus can potentially infect. And so you see there are receptors for it on the lung. There's some in the GI tract, some in the liver and gallbladder, some in the pancreas, um, and in and around islet cells, uh, kidney and urinary bladder, um, in gonadal tissue. And these are the predominant areas where this uh, virus can potentially cause trouble. Okay. And uh, take it from uh, the Silicon Valley doctor, uh, Garvin in 2020 put together data from bronchoalveolar lavages where basically they suck out sputum from deep in the lungs and then they look at the expression of different genes. They took all this data and they fed it into a supercomputer to help to try to understand what was happening to cause severe uh, infection with COVID. And here they choo chose a little bit of unfortunate colors here. Red means it makes it go up or produce more and blue means it suppresses. So basically what happens is in, in this process, the virus upregulates expression of those receptors through which it infects and it downregulates ACE. Uh, much like someone who might take an ACE inhibitor, which results in an accumulation of bradykinin. And bradykinin has several effects throughout the body. Um, it can cause issues with the heart. It can cause vasodilation, which means your blood vessels open up, which lets uh, more inflammation um, and lowers blood pressure. Uh, it can also cause edema in the lungs um, and accumulation of uh, hyaluronic acid and hydrogel, which basically makes the blood gas exchange more difficult. It can also affect the brain, causing encephalopathy, dizziness, headaches, cognitive impairment, or ischemia, and can cause muscle aches. And certainly, all of these things have been reported with COVID infection. So this may be one potential mechanism through which uh, COVID exerts some of its negative side effects. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss evidence here, because one of the issues is you are bombarded in the popular media with news about science. And news about science is often presented as if it were 
absolute fact, absolute truth. One must remember that science is always a process of making a hypothesis, making a guess as to how something works, testing that hypothesis to see whether what you thought was happening was actually happening. And if you're uh, mistaken or it doesn't explain things completely, you refine your hypothesis and do it again. Um, so there are different forms of evidence that we take um, and we treat sort of differently within the medical landscape. And it used to be the case that people sort of described it as a pyramid where a couple example cases was considered sort of the lowest level of evidence and the accumulated evidence from a bunch of randomized control trials, sort of the gold standard was considered the best form of evidence. Now, one of the big problems when we talk about observations, and this happens very much in, in the popular media, is somebody will say thing A is related to thing B. And us being humans and using heuristics, we will oftentimes think that because thing A goes up along with thing B, the two must be uh, associated with one another. So I could say the stock price of, uh, of GameStop, for example, was associated with um, that, the number of vaccinations that had been given. That doesn't mean that one caused the other. It's just both went up a little bit with time. OK, so very important to know what we have from any pandemic or epidemic, it always starts with observations. We look at what's happening in our world and we try to explain and try to figure out what is associated with a bad outcome, for example. So I have basically tried to summarize the data that we do have, but keep in mind that the level of evidence for some of these can be just observation or in some cases even expert opinion, which just means you take somebody who has content knowledge and then they give you their thoughts on the matter based on what they have read. Um, so there has been no conclusive evidence that the risk of developing COVID-19 is greater for those with diabetes. So that means you're not necessarily more likely to get infected just because one lives with diabetes. But if someone with diabetes develops COVID, there is a lot of evidence that suggests that your risk of death in the hospital and disease severity are worse. And this is especially true once someone gets into the hospital. Um, the other question that has been asked multiple times, and this has been published now several, several times, is that lockdown didn't adversely affect glucose control uh, and may actually be beneficial to those with poorer baseline control. Now, uh, you know, this is just to say that one might have more resources to devote to diabetes during lockdown, uh, but one must also balance that against the uh, economic hardships that that might entail. So the other finding was that the current epidemic has been associated with higher rates of DKA uh, in new onset pediatric diabetes, presumably because people are waiting longer to seek care. So some more recent work, um, a, a good friend of mine at Vanderbilt, Justin Gregory, along with a few folks from the rest of the country, reported greater illness severity in those with type 1 diabetes with an odds ratio of 3.9, meaning people's odds were almost four times higher for having greater illness severity if they had type 1. And that severity correlated with A1C, high blood pressure, race, recent episodes of uh, ketoacidosis, health insurance sat status, and less use of diabetes technology. And these things all correlate with socioeconomic status as well um, and access to care. Another paper by my friend Roque 
uh, Cardona Hernandez from Spain, uh, was published in Pediatric Diabetes, uh, reporting the experiences from uh, Wuhan, China, Italy, Spain, uh, Catalonia, Spain, and the Bay Area, suggesting a very mild or asymptomatic course of disease for pediatric age individuals with type 1 diabetes. Uh, they suggest against generalizing adult findings to pediatrics, but what this uh, tends to show and what we've typically been seeing is that age trumps diabetes status. So if you're, very, if you're on the younger side and you have diabetes, that doesn't necessarily mean the diabetes is gonna outweigh the fact that you're young and healthy. Okay, so let's, let's just talk about an ounce of prevention because as we say, it's worth a pound of cure. Um, whenever you can, get the vaccine. Uh, you also, in the meantime, want to continue to wear your face masks, wash hands with soap and water for over 20 seconds, or use a hand sanitizer with greater than 60% alcohol. Um, you know, some of these things were in more short supply earlier in 2020, and the things have certainly changed a little bit there. You want to avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Uh, maintain social distancing about six feet from others. Don't gather in large groups. Clean and disinfect frequently touch surfaces daily and avoid travel if possible. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, specifically diabetes tips. Okay, so you know, nothing, nothing really has changed here. I'm still going to recommend you do the best you can. Um, you want to keep a reasonable supply of medications because we know from the uh, scarcity of toilet paper that if one doesn't uh, put some, uh, some constraints on how much an individual can take, uh, that can lead to chaos and, and running out. So for, for everyone, at least two weeks worth of supplies, but keeps, uh, keep on hand uh, what you'll need for a, for a little while, but not, not five years worth because it will expire before you need it. Um, and then do not delay getting emergency care if you need it. I, I think this is something that we've found that people are sometimes landing up in, in greater problems because they're not going in for care when they need it. Uh, you want to uh, practice the same sick day management if one does get sick, especially early on. Um, but if one needs help, then uh, certainly reasonable to go to the hospital. Um, and then we want to sort of consider the hazard ratios from the Holman 2020 NHS data. So this is data out of England on uh, several thousand individuals with type 1 diabetes who were admitted to the hospital and then looking at uh, their, their risk of uh, really, really severe disease or death here. And you'll notice that the one that is super, super significant is age. So if you were less than 40 years, uh, you were in good shape. And things got progressively uh, more irksome as you got into the 70 to 79, greater than 80 um, age group. Uh, the rest of them are, are not pulling away too, too far from, from baseline risk. But what we can say is that, uh, you know, somewhere an A1C somewhere in the sixes or sevens probably beneficial. Um, a GFR, meaning your kidney function being good is a great one. Uh, having a normal-ish BMI is also a, a good factor. And the rest of these are sort of close enough to baseline as to not necessarily tell us one way or the other. Okay. Now, what if one does get sick? So uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America uh, is a great group for infectious disease, and they publish on their recommendations. And they basically have said no to hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, lopinavir, ritonavir, tocilizumab, famotidine, uh, bamlanivimab. Uh, but perhaps in clinical trials, one could consider convalescent plasma, meaning uh, plasma from people who were sick, famotidine, uh, combination agents of rindesivir, corticosteroids, plus uh, bar baricitinib, 
uh, and in severe COVID, they do recommend dexamethasone uh, with this other combo of dexamethasone as contraindicated and remdesivir. And that's severe disease. So if it's mild, it's not necessarily going to help you. And you know, I think the big news and the thing that a lot of people are going to be asking about is, well, what about these vaccines? Um, and so WebMD did a nice job sort of tabulating things. Um, and here we see that Pfizer and Moderna, who make the messenger RNA vaccines, um, are, are sort of the first approved ones by the FDA, uh, somewhere between 94 to 95% efficacy after two injections separated out by three to four weeks. Uh, perhaps consider using, using in pregnancy, but that's a sort of individual decision. Um, and then there are cases where if somebody had a known allergy to one of the vaccine ingredients, they may not want to get this one. Um, there are some cases of anaphylaxis, which is why we wait the 15 minutes, make sure everyone's doing okay. And these vaccines are completely new in how they operate. Uh, most of the time we either give um, a viral agent that has been modified, weakened, or a component of uh, a virus in order to induce an immune response with vaccines. With messenger RNA, we are exploiting uh, something that was sort of figured out in the early 2000s, that if you inject someone with messenger RNA, uh, your cells will actually take it up and express it if it's properly packaged. Um, and what we do is the portion of the virus that causes the infection is the spike protein. The spike protein is the part that is responsible for the specific tissues that get infected. So the reality is if, if the virus mutated enough to change that receptor, you probably wouldn't have the same infectivity properties. So that was the, that was the particle that they chose to select for. So they take that portion of the virus, and they create a complementary messenger RNA for it. Now, when it's not attached to the virus, it tends to have a different three-dimensional structure. So they did alter the sequence a little bit to help give it that same spike protein shape. And when they've now modified it, they can get your cells to start putting out spike protein in a sort of similar 3D shape and then you form an immune reaction to it. Now, you can similarly take that portion of the virus and put it into an inactivated virus uh, or a modified virus, and then you can cause that virus to do the, uh, do the insertion for you and then cause that immune reaction. But the key is you want it to attack a part of the virus that is responsible for the infection. And the big question that we get all the time is when can we get it? And, and the real issue here is who decides who gets the vaccines and in what order? It's policymakers. And in the US, final say it has been left to individual states. So here is an example in California, um, but this varies tremendously. And here in the states we've chosen to vaccinate our healthcare providers first. However, in other countries like the UK, they went for the population most at risk of death, which is the elderly population first, uh, with healthcare providers following shortly thereafter. So it is sort of up to policymakers, hopefully informed by the medical community, to make these decisions. So with that, I want to leave a lot of time here for us to chat. I want to thank the endocrinology team at Stanford, my mentor, Dr. Bruce Buckingham, uh, and the National Institute of uh, Digestive and Diabetes and Kidney Disease, uh, who provides funding for me, and the Stanford Maternal and Child Health Research Institute. Um, so let's 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 talk about all this. Sounds great. What an informative presentation, Rehan. Thank you so much. So we did have a couple of questions that were um, submitted. Um, you can stop sharing your slides if you'd like. Um, 
So the first question that we got was someone has heard that people with type O blood are more protected from the virus. Is this true? And if so, do you, do we know why? So I saw that same popular media article. And again, there may be some observational evidence for this finding. Now, does that mean there is causality, meaning you are for sure that it was the type O blood that protected you. Or maybe it's just that a lot of people with type O exist in a region that has a nice socioeconomic status, which might make it easier to survive an infection or happen to be younger. It's very hard to determine causality because we're not randomizing people to get infected or not and deducing the outcome. So all we can say is that perhaps there is some association, but we can't spell out the exact causality, although people can always in a lab setting try to figure out what might be uh, contributing. Yeah, and type O is the most common type of blood, correct? Uh, it's among amongst the more amongst the more common. Got it. And one of the other questions was, you know, if quote age trumps diabetes, um, you know, how do people who are older, for example, um, one person participant put in that she's 64 and has had type one for 52 years, and that feels pretty scary. So I guess, you know, what what would you recommend for people who are in that cohort? Yeah, so this is this is probably the more relevant question for 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 us is now we have folks who, you know, are, are living into their 80s and 90s and hundreds with type one. And clearly, if you are landing up in a hospital, then you're at a little bit more chance of having bad outcomes when you have diabetes. So the the reality is that one really has to protect themselves in that situation. You want to go through all the preventative stuff, um, you know, and I think it is, it is a situation where one mentions the age 64 because 65 is when a lot of groups are starting their vaccines um, and it's sort of like being right on the cusp. The good news is that we are proceeding in a tiered manner with these vaccination programs. And obviously none of these vaccines offer 100% protection, but it would be a very important step towards prevention, especially amongst uh, folks who are on the older, more at risk side. Yeah, I think it's it's great advice. And, and as you said earlier, you know, the more that we can do to prevent you know, getting COVID ahead of time, I think is the, the best that we can do as people with diabetes. And, and it is a shared responsibility. So to all the younger people on the call, I would advocate help your friends in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s out there. Yeah, think of your nice grandma. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so one of the next questions is, so since type one is an autoimmune disease, do we need to you know, further assess whether we have other autoimmune conditions in order to get the vaccine? The, so, so there is not necessarily uh, yet been shown a real causal relationship between a vaccine and other autoimmune conditions. With type one, one undergoes, you know, routine screening for some other autoimmune conditions such as celiac um, and and thyroid disease, which go along with it. However, one must also keep in mind that the the concern regarding autoimmune conditions comes out of the fact that, hey, I'm having an immune reaction to part of this virus. Well, if you actually get the virus the same thing's going to happen. So it's you're not comparing to sort of baseline zero risk in this situation. Um, and it remains to be seen. I wish I could say, uh, you know, everything is known at this stage. Uh, but, you know, these, these are all things that will have to be investigated as time goes on. Yeah, and I believe there is 
even a registry for people with diabetes and COVID. Is that correct? There, there are there are some some places, uh, and particularly you know in, in the centers that have been doing studies on this. Frequently, they're they're making folks uh, enter into a registry for participation and future data collection. Yeah, I think it's perfect. I think it's similar to the other, you know, like the long haulers and people that are having symptoms further out in COVID. You know, again, it, this is all science is a, an art. <laughs> you know, it's a moving process, ever changing. Okay. And, and, you know, like, like Rayhan said, you know, typically you should be screened about yearly for thyroid, at least. And then if you are having any concerns about, you know, gluten intolerance or celiac, you should check with your, your healthcare team and they can get you screened as well. Um, one of the next, a couple of questions in the chat are about any updates on the clinical trials and or vaccine availability for kids. Yes, so, so let's talk about that a little bit. So these are all sort of reflections of what the FDA and other regulatory agencies are comfortable with, right? So when you're saying, I am going to run a trial, you start by talking with the agency. And part of that discussion often involves who will be the population you're recruiting. Now, there is nothing that says that the companies, uh, you, you know, the companies would be ecstatic if they could push more vaccines, right? Because that's the, you know, it makes them a little bit of profit. But the reality is we usually try to preserve the vulnerable population, pregnant women uh, and children, as the next group that gets tested after adults. So anytime you approach someone with, I want to test this, they will frequently keep the age within a tight-ish window. And they did allow, you know, Pfizer to go down to 16. So that was great. But what that means is that after the agency does that, the agency can then only allow for emergency use authorization on the population that they originally decided was the one who should be tested. And especially with emergency use authorization, they are going to say, you must do it exactly the way they did it in the clinical trial. So the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, for example, they could probably be kept at exactly the same temperature and be stable at the same temperatures. But the reality is because they stored them in a certain way during the clinical trials, that's the temperature you have to store them when you give them. So it's just merely a function of how our regulatory system works. Yes, I know more about that than I care to sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and do we think, I think sort of in the same sense that, that adults living with diabetes are, you know, we're considered sort of higher risk. I don't know if we're, if the data has rep been reported on kids with diabetes as far as severity of illness. I, I know in general, the kids are, are sort of getting like a lighter version of it, if you will. They're more resilient than us yeah. um, adults. But but do you think that that the kids with diabetes should be considered, you know, higher risk and sort of get access earlier? So so this is an interesting question. And certainly when, you know, again, part of it is dependent upon when that emergency use authorization age group hits, right? So if it's 16 and above, then yes, if you're a 16 year old with type one, you might have very low risk, but you're still, you still fall within the parameters of whatever governing bodies say this group gets the vaccines. If you are below that age, however, then you're in a, you're in a different category. And even though you might say, we're going to prioritize this individual over others of that same age, you're not going to necessarily prioritize them over other adults. So that's the, that's the situation. And the reality is, I, and listen, I want to be completely clear here. There are always going to be outlier cases where somebody can get very sick or even die from these things. But the reality is the, the vast majority of people who have been having the very bad outcomes from this have been the elderly population. So 
for right now, that is the population who is at most at risk of death. And this is why the UK, for example, chose that population to vaccinate first. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, another question that's sort of a little bit different about about COVID, and and I know that we've seen sort of increased rates of DKA for on on diagnosis, and you know, perhaps it's because people are waiting to go. But but the question is, do we think we'll be seeing? a higher incidence of diagnosis of type one because of the virus? This is, this is a un unknown question at this point. The problem, so the problem is nobody can treat COVID 2020 or even 2019 uh, in isolation uh, because a lot of different stuff happened during that time, right? We have not encountered phenomenons where masses of children were sheltered in place. We have not encountered situations where people were losing their jobs and loved ones at the rate that they have been. Uh, so these are all a multivariate problem, right? It's not just turn COVID on, incidence gets higher, turn COVID off, incidence gets, no, that we don't, we wouldn't be able to very easily tease out that data retrospectively. It may be the case, but it would be a very difficult question to answer. And, and part of one thing that you should always try to do as a thought exercise, and I say this to the whole audience, is if you have a question, ask yourself, how would I ask this question in a way that I could tease out the thing that I wanted to tease out? And you will find that it is much harder than you might actually have envisioned because of all the other things that happen in a person's life. So observations are a very powerful tool, but they are also very, we'll say, dirty because there's so much else that's going on. Kind of like when you look at your blood sugar on your CGM or on your BG meter and you're 200 and you're thinking, so is this the pizza? Is this the stress? Is this the lack of my exercising because I'm sheltering in place and it's cold outside? It's the same, the same kind of thing. Nothing is, a, is black and white, unfortunately. Yep. Um, so one of the questions that we have is several groups led by the ADA and I'll, I'll say you don't have to comment if you feel uncomfortable, um, have asked the CDC to include people with type 1 diabetes in a higher priority group for vaccines. And, and the question is, do you have a comment on that? Yes. So, you know, I, I think Justin uh, Gregory over at, at Vandy and I are really good friends. And I noticed that there were at least two papers out of Vandy where they were really uh, instrumental in saying, listen, we have data here that shows that there is a excess risk of death in people with type 1. And because it's being left, unfortunately, to the state level right now, it would be great if we had mandates from above, but not yet. So we're trying to figure out, um, you know, where should this prioritization be? I, I think it is very reasonable to consider uh, vaccination earlier for populations at risk, including those with type one. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And the other, so there's a couple of questions about the vaccine specifically. And, and one of them is, you know, people are feeling anxious about getting the vaccine because it came out quickly um, and that, you know, haven't had enough time to sort of track all the side effects that are happening. And is there validity to the concern and the fears that a lot of people are having? Yeah, so so I will say this is unprecedented what, what has happened with approval processes for this, right? So if you think about it, you know, normally vaccines have to go through rigorous testing because they're going to be given to such a large number of people. The mRNA technology that is being discussed for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, it's been around for a while, but there's never been a killer use, right? There's never been a, a use that really made it like, hey, we got to push this thing. And this was the perfect place where they had a chance 
to get this through. And the reality is that it, we, we simply did not have time for the usual review processes that go on. Now, I am completely comfortable with it. I got both vaccines, feel fine myself, but can I say that that will apply to 7 billion people? It's hard, it's hard to make that claim. So I would highly encourage everybody to get vaccinated, but one really doesn't necessarily, as a scientist, I cannot say with 100% confidence, uh, you know, that, that every, every person will do fine. And we've seen, you know, some people do have these con concerns of uh, severe allergies, and uh, we, we found a way to treat that. So I, I think the reality is, though, especially if you are a person who's at high risk of death or disability from the disease, then one weighs the pros and cons. And in that case, the pros greatly outweigh the cons. Right. Well, and, and, you know, one of the other questions that we have here, and I've sort of heard um, sort of mixed things from my friends with diabetes is, is, is there any data, you know, besides anecdotal, uh, what you hear from your friends on vaccine having any effect on blood sugars? Most, most likely any time there's sort of a foreign body response uh, or inflammation, it induces the release of some stress hormones and inflammatory cytokines. And as a result, those are all insulin resistance mediators. So one unit of insulin doesn't necessarily go as far. Now, compare that though to the effect of the virus. I've seen people on insulin drips needing 55 units per hour uh, when they're really sick with, uh, with COVID and diabetes. So uh, the reality is, yes, you might be up a few units, but compared to the alternative, it's, uh, it's not going to be anywhere near the extreme. Yeah, I'm assuming that the people on those insulin drips might be taking some steroids. And actually, that was one of the questions that I was going to ask is how they're managing people's blood sugars in the hospital setting. And it sounds like they're doing insulin drips, probably for the more severe cases? See, so this is, this is where it gets really tricky, right? Because one of, the, one of the concerns about insulin drips is that then means a bedside nurse has to go in every hour to get a blood sugar, putting, uh, putting them potentially at right. excess risk of contracting the disease. So there has been a little pushback about insulin drips, even though that might be the most effective form of management uh, during these times where insulin needs are going up, down, left, right. So there are a couple schools of thoughts on ways we can uh, make this easier, such as putting sensors on people in the hospital and doing remote, uh, remote insulin drip settings. So that's in, under investigation at a great many centers. Um, there's also the thought for the non-ICU patients of sticking closed loop on them, uh, and, and we're actively working on that with uh, Insulet now. Well, man, talk about another silver lining of the pandemic. I'm, I'm hoping at the end of this, we get more CGMs for people in the hospital. I mean, oof. Um, okay, so back to the vaccine. <laughs> um, so how about, so for example, um, Richard, one of the participants who I happen to know, he has had type one for 75 years. He's 81. He had the first dose of his Moderna vaccine and after the second dose, you know, he says, I'm still sort of at risk to get the virus. But is it supposed to be sort of less, you know, less intense, sort of like flu shots are supposed to be? Uh, th that's that's the hope. That's the real hope out of the clinical trials is that you, while while you might still contract the illness, it won't be as severe or potentially won't put you in the hospital. So even though, and, and this uh, holds true with the flu vaccine as well, there are people who may still get flu, but they may not end up in the hospital as a result. That's great. And then, you know, how about, and I don't know if we know this yet, and I think, you know, this also 
depends on how the virus mutates. And, you know, again, we're all kind of flying by the seat of our pants in these lovely unprecedented times. <laughs> but how long after we get the vaccine are we anticipating having antibodies and protection against COVID? I, I really wish I had the answer to that. What we can say is that there was still evidence of protection from those who were enrolled in the clinical trials around the six month mark or so. So likely uh, what that means is there will be at least some durable protection. And the other thing I wanted to mention related to what I was speaking to before was, as I said, this tends to target the spike protein, which is necessary for infection, which means if you get a UK variant, if you get a South African variant, unless they totally change up the design of their spike protein in a way that still allows targeting of ACE2, the good news is theoretically, the variant should also be covered. Oh, I love that news, thank you. <laughs> That is really good news. I am glad to hear that. Um, for people with diabetes and immunodeficiency, um, one of the questions, will you be told to get antibody testing weeks or months after the vaccine? And is this being studied? Not that I'm aware of. Um, and it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. The reality is the world needs to get out 7 billion vaccines to that many, you know, to the world population, right? It doesn't, it doesn't help if just the socioeconomically privileged or just the people over 75 get it. We need to vaccinate as many people as we possibly can. So invariably what that means is there will be post hoc analyses, there will be studies on variant populations. And so one could figure that that might be something. And, and the, other, the other important factor here is remember, because we don't know the duration of protection, if this then becomes like the next flu shot, then we also need to factor in, well, how long does protection last for the general population? And then one can think about um, folks who might be uh, a, a little immunodeficient. That makes complete sense. Um, this question is a little uh, a little different than the others, but I want to make sure we we get the question answered. So this is from someone whose daughter is eleven, and she says she's not really concerned about her dying, but she's worried about organ damage. And the, the question is, is there research being done on people on kids who have organ damage from COVID? Yeah, so this may be in reference to the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in, in children, also known as MISC, um, which is a, a sort of originally was was compared to Kawasaki uh, disease, mm -hmm. uh, wherein wherein there's more inflammation in a child than one might otherwise predict, which may lead to more systemic problems. So the, here's here's the thing. It is, uh, it, it, it is relatively rare with the original variant. We don't know if any of these other variants may present differently. And the, the reality is for parents and grandparents, I, I just want you to keep in mind, you are at far greater risk than your children are, okay? So, I mean, the reality is you always, a, a parent of someone with type one is a brother of someone with type one, we always worry about the person with the diabetes, but the reality is, as I said, age trumps diabetes. So make sure that you, you don't lose that sense of prevention for yourself um, in worrying about your child, because I think the reality is the odds are more uh, on that side than the other. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to put your oxygen mask on first before you can put it on someone else. Exactly. So. You know, exactly. this is that self-care promotion. Please take care of ourselves. Back when we to used to fly. Too. Yes, I know. Well, and, and you know, one of the other questions um, that I had that has not been asked um, is, you know, I've seen a lot of studies about the, you know, obesity and 
overweight being one of the big sort of indicators on how severe COVID-19 or the virus will, will react in your body. And, and I wondered if you could just, you know, speak to that and, you know, let us know sort of what you think and what you suggest for those of us that might have gained the COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, so let's, um, if, if it's okay with you, I just want sure. to screen share one more time here with uh, with the Absolutely. hazard ratios here, and let's let's look at the BMI data a little bit more specifically here. So, if you'll notice, there is the classic U-shaped curve, right? So, if you're on the extremes, there is a, a propensity for worse outcomes, and if you're in the middle, you're in you're in reasonable shape. And I will point out, although this is this is now probably making uh, very mild differences seem more significant than they actually are, but the folks in sort of the overweight category here were at lower risk uh, than those in the normal weight category by just a tad. Now, that reverses itself once we get into the obese and right. class one, class two, class three obesity here. Um, so, so it is really the extremes. I think the reality is we all have to take care of ourselves um, in, in these times, just as I would say in any other time, you know, eat right, exercise, do all these things for your cardiovascular health, your physical well-being. And, and the reality is, I know some people really do feel trapped at home. I don't want you to feel trapped. I just want people to take the appropriate precautions and, and do take walks outside because uh, for our own sanity, we do need to still, uh, still be enjoying life a little bit and not get sort of trapped in, in, in the house or the office or wherever it is you find yourself uh, on Monday morning. Yes, I think that's, very salient advice <laughs> and it gets and it's been hard and I think you know when we when more places were locked down you know it was very restricted and now it's it it's just ever changing and we're getting used to it of course we're in the the colder months for those of us that are not in beautiful northern California but <laughs> you know layer up <laughs> Marissa, it got I mean it was it must have been 68 degrees uh, this weekend freezing Absolutely yeah it sounds freezing. it sounds tough and we all feel sorry for you <laughs> um one of the other questions that just came in was so for having sore throats um symptoms they've been tested for covid but not able to go into the hospital even though she has have covid before would she be so would this person be more prone to sort of having these symptoms after having COVID is I think what the question is. I, I and, and I, I read it, I read that one a little bit. I, I'm wondering if the question is the balance between COVID versus strep throat, right? So right. people get strep throat, people get COVID, and, and now you're in a position where if you're in, in the COVID wheelhouse, then people want you under precautions. If you're in the strep throat wheelhouse, then you, you know, you take your antibiotics and you get on with your life. So the, the reality is um, that one should still be getting the same sort of primary care treatment that one had before. Uh, that might mean getting a throat swab or rapid strep test uh, to determine if that's the causative agent. Um, and, and certainly the other side of the coin is there are delays in care if one does develop COVID. So for example, you know, you might have been anticipating a, a surgery for something, you get a positive test and then that surgery is delayed or something else gets delayed. So also keep in mind that part of the reason we advocate for the prevention is because it can cause delays in care and other, other aspects. Thank you, I appreciate it. Are there any other sort of last, you know, big tips for people to, to take home from from today? Well, I, I, I really just want to say thank you to everyone who, uh, who was in on this. And I, I do think uh, that a really an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this case. So do what you can to stay safe. 
I have, I have heard cases where people did everything they were supposed to and still got sick, but at least one tried. And I think the reality is um, we, we exist in a world that has some risks. Those of us who live with diabetes, we know that life is not without some risk uh, and we have to do what we can for some risk mitigation here, but also keep in mind that our mental health, our sanity, requires us to uh, to have interaction with people. And, you know, things like Zoom, things like these uh, other video platforms, they give us an outlet where we can talk with friends, we can maintain some sense of social interaction. And I think it is very important we take advantage of those things. Yeah, that's making me really glad that I'm in this pandemic and not the 1918 one. <laughs> Uh, and we'd have to wear those big masks. Talk about being worried about wearing a mask in public. Those things were a lot. <laughs> I, 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 I would have one tin can with a string. You'd have another tin can. That's uh, I, it, it's it's the way the, it's it's the way uh, I, I used to communicate. <laughs> Thank goodness for what we do have, right? Absolutely. Well, well. Thank you so much. I, you are just a wealth of knowledge and. I, I love the way that, you know, you take it all in and, you know, I really appreciate, I think we all, and I myself included, always like to hear some reassurance and encouragement. I think, you know, it's been, it's been over a year now and we're in it and we're just, you know, we're marathoning. So I don't know, slow and steady wins the race, right? That's the approach that I'm taking. I don't know. And just, you know, taking it day by day. So I, I'm excited about everything that's on the horizon. And I'm really excited to hear that hopefully these mutations are still under this vaccine. That was huge, Rehan. Thank you. So let's, let's all stay strong and stay safe. Really appreciate, really appreciate everyone who tuned in. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I wish you a uh, normal glycemic blood sugars. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.